Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace yeah. Steady job and some food to eat Just give me a little bit of peace Got a brother on the line who's currently working on a documentary about his life story And he's here to share a little bit of it with us Ladies and gentlemen, on the line from Five Deuce Hoover Gangster Crip in Tennessee, I have Lamont. What up, Lamont? What's going on, man? How you doing? Oh, Shout doing out good. to Dusty Vision, man. Thank you, homie. Thank you. I appreciate you once again joining the program and sharing your story with us. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, let's... Uh, appreciate let's, you, man. Thank you, homie. Thank you. Uh, let's take it all the way back, man. Way, way back. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up on the east side of Nashville, Tennessee, man, originally. Um, yeah, all through the east side, man. Later came out uh, after doing the long bid, seven years. Mm. Came out with family, L.A., you know. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's even go back a little bit further, you know, before you you – I guess, quote unquote, jumped off the porch or whatnot. Who were some of the gangs, if there were any, you know, present really in the Nashville area before Crips and Bloods made an appearance? There were there really wasn't any gangs back in the day, man. I mean, you had certain cats going against each other. Uh, east side may go against the west side, vice versa, or south side or whatever, man. It really wasn't any any gangs uh, back in the day, man, at all. You know, no official gang where, you know, you had members. So it was basically a lot of cats who primarily grew up with each other in the same neighborhoods or whatever. That, but that was it before the Crips and Blood. Okay. And what about you? What was your upbringing like back then? You know, was mom around, dad around? Mom was around, you know, which you normally have. <laughs> it's crazy to that. In some places, that's the norm, but that's what it is, man. I grew up in a single-family home. Uh, I didn't meet my pops until I was like 11 years old. Uh, and I probably didn't see him no more after that for like four years. But, yeah, just grew up. My mom, my grandmother raised me, rest in peace. Uh, but that's it, man. You know, I was a uh, only child. You no, know, grew up on the east side of Nashville, man. My upbringing was was basic, man. You know, grew up in the project. You know, grew up in what's considered, you know, uh, low income area. And you know, went to school, dropped out of school, man, at a young age, and started getting into life of crime, man. Probably around fourteen or fifteen. Okay. Well, to the best of your knowledge, when did Crips and Bloods, you know, first make an appearance? When, I guess when's the first time you ever even heard of Crips or Bloods? Well, before I answer that question, man, I'm going to say this, man, you know, and no disrespect and no shade on uh, nobody, man. But from my recollection, man, and I can say that for a fact because I was present, that the first time I ever seen or heard of any Crips, um, like 1986, 1987 in Nashville, man. And back then, cats wasn't gang banging. You know, you just had a, a lot of affiliates that would come down to Nashville, man, and do their thing, you know, from L.A. But yeah, definitely, the 107s, underground, the first gang that I seen with my own eyes. And then start, other gangs started to come down a couple of years after that. Okay. And you mentioned um, offline that you were actually present when the first 107 UGCs were put on. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I was in the pen with the, uh, the very first Nashville. Um, let's make that clear. Yeah. The Nashville member was put on by L.A. 107 UGCs. Man, I was in the pen present right there when it all took place. That was in 1992. I came off the porch with this gang thing, man, back in uh, September 1990, man. Mm. You know, being the first member in Tennessee uh, that ever claimed and represented, you know, that was known, uh, you know, 
again, you might have some cats to try to dispute that, but they can't because the truth is the truth. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. And take me back, you know, to that time period of when you, you know, joined, started, clicked up with uh, Five Deuce. Well, back then, again, you know, you had some cats from different sets around 89, 90, man. They came down doing their thing, and uh, some of them got caught up, had to do some time, and uh, it was brand new. You know, Nashville at that time was a virgin turf, you know, for a few things, you know, street life, game bang life. Wasn't nobody doing it like L.A. was doing it, so... You know, met a couple of cats from Five Deuce, one in particular, uh, another cat at the same time. He was from Harlem 30s. You know, uh, that was in 1990, man. That was in the county jail. And our county jail in Nashville, Tennessee, man, when that took place. Stayed there about a year, man. Okay. About a year, and then went off to the pen. And then from then on, maybe like 92, when I went to the pen, man, first penitentiary I ever touched, touched down. First few guys that I put on, first five guys that I put on at that particular pen, man. That happened in a pen called Northwest Correctional Center in Tennessee, like West Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about prison, um, but I want to kind of go a little bit slower. So, um, when did you did you do the juvie, juvie juvenile hall thing? You know, jail. I didn't, I didn't really do the juvenile hall thing, man. I you know I went to the juvenile facility right there in the city a few times, but I did a whole bid in the prison system, man. Did probably collectively maybe a whole year and a half in the county prior to going to prison. Okay. And what's it like for an active gang member to? you know, enter jail. Let's go, let's start with jail. What, what was that whole situation? Well, like? see, it was a whole different situation, man, because in Nashville, we were slow to it, you know, so you had guys that really didn't understand the whole makeup of gang banging in Nashville because it, it didn't start in Nashville for one, you know, and uh, it was something new, you know, so guys that I probably knew prior to that or, you know, were older, they really didn't understand it because we didn't have a gang, a gang life in Nashville at the time. Okay. And we talked a little bit offline about the movie Colors, and you mentioned that the movie Colors did play a part of influencing gangs around like the '88, but um, they had no clue on how to properly represent either organization, the Crips or the Bloods. Can you kind of go a little bit further into that? Yeah, man, and what I mean by not properly representing, man, because at times, man, you know, you had guys that would come from Los Angeles, claim, and you have to really highlight the word claim, claim to be a gang member or a gang banger, and knowing that we didn't have the knowledge of, could easily get in and say, you know, I'm from here, I'm from this set or that set, you know, and start putting cash down, you know, that later changed, you know, when, when brothers like myself started to get more knowledge of w what really was going on and had to touch the soil myself, you know. So, yeah, man, it was a lot of cats, man, that was claiming to be Crips and Bloods, man, and, and uh, really wasn't their fault, you know, whoever put them on, you know. So, yeah, that's how that happened, man. Okay. What age range were you most active, would you say? Uh, age range, 17 and up at the time. You know, I was 18 at the time. I'm, I'm 48 one day of being 49 tomorrow, but I was 18, man, uh, when I started getting my feet wet into this, this cribbing, man, for real. Okay. And what about Nashville? Because, you know, I grew up, I'm, I'm in my 40s as well, mid 40s. And, you know, the 90s, it was just crazy. You know, late 80s, early 90s, even for a civilian like myself, 
what what was Nashville experiencing a a same you know type of uptick in in crime and gang activity in the you know early oh hours? yeah oh yeah because like you were saying man you know when colors came out that definitely influenced guys you know females to try and represent or claim something that they had no clue about about the actual lifestyle you know so you know you had people you know young age 16 15 18 wearing blue flags and red flags but they didn't know what they was doing man and, you know some of the people that probably didn't know each other or may have grew up with each other end up being enemies just because I'm going to pick this red side. I'm going to pick this blue side back then, man. So around 88, 89 is when you start to see that. But, you know, you can't really count those people as being really official because the people didn't properly have hands put on them, you know, initiated properly, you know, uh, by Los Angeles, man, to get that stamp put on it, man, you know? Yep. Numbers-wise... Is Nashville more of a Crip city or a Blood city? Numbers wise, obviously. Um, as far as that concerned, man, you know the Crips definitely outnumber the Bloods in Nashville. Uh, but most recently, I say in the last five, six years, seven years, it's been a lot of factions of Bloods, man, appearing, and you know more cats coming down from Los Angeles coming to Nashville or surround the area. Just give me a little bit of peace. Um, I had a, a cat from my show, um, on my show from Nashville, and he kind of mentioned that rappers like Mac 10 and Snoop Dogg had some sort of an influence on gangs in Nashville. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to say this. Maybe in his, his age bracket, you know, he, he might be a youngster. And when Mac 10 or Snoop Dogg came, it might, may have been an influence for him and whoever he was around. But that's definitely false because Crippin' and Blood was, was in Nashville way before Mac 10 and Snoop Dogg ever touched. So, yeah, that's that's false. Okay, but definitely movies like Colors. Would you say like stuff like Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society, things like that also kind of have an influence? Definitely, yeah. definitely. I think you know Boys in the Hood and Menace to Society, man, had an influence on on you know the black culture period and others. You know, all over the United States, but as far as Nashville, you know, it just Andy up to. You know, the crime, you know, when you see a, a, a movie like that, it's so surreal, man, and it make you want to be a part of it. You know, especially if you're a youngster, you don't know any better. But it makes you want to be a part of that type of lifestyle. So I would say, yes, man, they had a, those two movies as well had a major influence. Crime, how to finesse it better, you know, become a better criminal, and, you know, uh, drive-by, you know, prior to that, Cats wasn't doing drive-bys and stuff like that, man. So gang culture definitely influenced, you know, how things later became, you know, as far as the streets. Okay. Yeah, being that you're in the, you know, the age range where we were around when crack cocaine was, was huge, I saw how it devastated communities in L.A. with my own eyes, even looking back, um, hindsight, but uh, you were living through it. You know, did did Nashville or take me back to, you know, the times when Nashville, you know, had a crack problem and and, and what you well, said. I, I can I can say something for a fact, but I'm gonna leave that for the documentary. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a little piece that's gonna but uh when the you know, I was present when the when the crack first hit, uh Nashville, but you know, I became incarcerated, man and did that seven calendar year bid. And so I, I didn't see the uprise of it. Mm. You know, I didn't see how effective it was, you know, for users and for dealers, man. You know, I could only hear what I would call home from the pen and 
really what was going on on the streets at that time in Nashville, you know. Mm-hmm. Motherfuckers get money and, you know, in a major way. What's the Mexican gang presence like in Nashville? Um, I mean, you can go certain parts of Nashville, man, and might see a few walls, uh, Mexican community, you know, struck up. You know, MS 13s, you know, they from El Salvador, so you might see that. You might see some uh, brown pride, you know, uh, you know, a few. Uh, I don't know how true or how much of a presence they had, but I've seen a few 18 streets struck up in Nashville, too, but I don't know how much influence that is, you know, because. I mean, you just, it, it's a totally difference in Los Angeles, man. Yeah. Totally different, man. You know, you don't, it's not even a, a Crippin' Blood war. It never have been, you know, in Nashville where it's constant like it is in Los Angeles. You know what I'm saying? It's just a, mainly a whole lot of cats on both sides just claiming or representing Crippin' Blood, man. It's never been a, like a major war. You may have some killings on each side. Uh, a few times, but not really, you know. It, it, it's not like that. It's not separated like that, you know, like it is, the formation is in Los Angeles where you might be on Hoover Street and go down the Figueroa across, you know, 110 Freeway and be on the east side and be in the enemy turf. It's not like that, you know, in Nashville, man. You know, you have the five deuces on every part of, of town, the east side, west side, north and south. So, and blood's the same way. Yep. Okay. Well, let's take it back to 1990. You know, just before you got that seven-year bid. Talk to me about what it's like, you know, being an active gang member, entering prison, you know, specifically. What, what was your first day like? You know, who do you check with? Like, explain to us. Well, you know, again, yeah, Tennessee, Tennessee had never seen the gang life, man. You know, and when you're in the Tennessee state prison system, man, at that time, um, you had a lot of older guys from Memphis, Nashville, surrounding areas, Knoxville, Chattanooga, you know, all together, right? So, being a gang member coming in, that was something something new for everybody, you know, not even see, being able to see something like that, the dress code, and until cats started to get locked up there was real gang bangers and I was able to you know uh, be introduced and and uh, meet a lot of LA gang members when I first hit the pen you know a couple of cats from 87 gangs which is on the east side of LA a uh, couple of cats from 98 Main Street also on the east side just give me a little bit of peace Steady job is some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job is some food to eat. Just who, give me I guess for the lack of better words, I'm going to put this in quotes, but who runs the prisons in Tennessee? <laughs> That's funny you ask that, man, because when I came home in 97, man, you know, nobody in particular ran the prisons or, you know, just depending on what part of the state you were in. East Tennessee, the Aaron Nations run the prisons. You know, more Middle Tennessee, Nashville, Chattanooga area, uh, the blacks run the prison. Um, now that you have a, a large amount of uh, Crips, uh, not any particular Crips, but just Crips as a whole, you have a lot of Crips or the gang disciples in different prisons. You know, they may run a particular prison on the uh, West Tennessee. You know, you, you have a, a lot of the same. Uh, in, in Memphis, man, it's, it's a lot of gang disciples and, and vice lords, man. So uh, I would say that they probably control that part uh, along with the Crips, gang disciples and the Crips, you know, probably in the prison system in Tennessee, I would say, from Middle Tennessee to West Tennessee. Okay. And I 
think earlier you mentioned something that about putting putting some people on while you were, while you were locked up. I call, yeah. Okay. Talk to me about the whole recruiting process and how you try to grow in numbers. Well, man, I mean, back then, man, again, you know, we had no clue, you know, and a couple of guys, like I mentioned, that was from two particular crib sets, man, you know, really introduced that lifestyle of uh, being put on. So we just followed suit, man, you know. It was a couple of, those couple of guys put on a few guys themselves. And for myself, you know, it's initiation. I mean, you understand initiation, man, so uh-huh. that's how they went, you know. Uh, we didn't have a, a particular place, really, in prison because prison is so open, you know, so you might have to fall in the bathroom or, or in a single cell or something, you know, and, and put a cat on. So. Now, I know when you mentioned when you first got locked up that, you know, Crips and Bloods were a new thing. Fast forward to 1997, was it more prevalent behind bars? Like, did you start, did the numbers grow drastically? Yeah, they started to grow. By the time that I, I was on my way out, it started to grow. Uh, the difference is Los Angeles, man, California, when you're dealing with prisons, it's a street gang that, you know, get locked up, gangs, members will get locked up for doing whatever, gang banging or whatever. It's a totally difference in Tennessee. Since we didn't have gangs on the street initially, a lot of the gangs were formed in prison until enough of them were able to come out, get out, and then start to initiate. So the process was totally different. Okay. I want to go, go in another direction a little bit, but um, how important you know, especially at that time when you were coming up building and things like that, how important was it or is it to touch base with the land, the quote unquote land for, you know, people out there who don't know what I'm talking about, Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, at the time I had lost contact with my OG homeboy from the county jail to the pen. So we didn't have, initially we didn't have a, a contact, but, um, for the cats, the two older cats who were from Main Street and from 87 Kitchen and 87 Gangster, uh, they kind of talk uh, the lifestyle of Crippin. You know, being from Hoover, nobody could really actually teach me how to groove, which is a difference. You know, teach me about the H, which we say, you know, the H is number one. Hoover is number one. Meaning it comes before Crippin. You know, because it was Hoover's before it was anything, before the Crip was even put on it. So, you know, at first we just had to kind of go with the flow, man. And and then once I came home, you know, I wanted all of that to change, you know, because I was heavy in it. And I wanted to make sure we got the right... Uh, education about it, the knowledge about the history of where we claim who the Hoovers were. From the full trade to the one way, I, I needed to know. So that's how that happened, man. When I took the trip, called my family members and took my first trip to Los Angeles, man. I was on a mission, you know, so I can bring that same knowledge back to Tennessee and spread the word, man. And to the best of your knowledge, why did Five Deuce decide to stay Crip while, you know, the other Hoovers uh, went the criminal route? Uh, I, I know that firsthand because I, a few years ago, back in 2007, 8, 9, I was shooting a, a documentary, One Nation Under the Groove, L.A. to Tennessee, where I had a lot of old cheap Hoovers on, on the documentary, man. Somehow I lost that footage. Oh, wow. Thanks to Culver City Police in Los Angeles. Oh, that's but that's another cool. story. Um, you know, once the Crips started fighting the Crips, man, you know, the homeless, uh, other than the five deuces, the rest of the, the homeless 
they not want to claim Crip anymore. You know, because they figured, you know, why be a Crip? Why stay a Crip if we only killing Crips? But, you know, the five deuces is going to stay the same. They didn't change the criminal, you know. And that's another thing that got tangled and twisted outside of California that when the whole Hoover car changed to criminal, except five deuces, a lot of cats, especially in Tennessee, thought that that's what it was. And, and actually in, in <laughs> New Jersey and New York, because I had the opportunity to go out there and straighten that situation out where a lot of five deuces thought that they was criminals hmm. and crips, which was the craziest thing I've heard. Interesting, okay. So you're, you're kind of like an ambassador to go to different cities and... <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the best word, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say I'm an ambassador, <laughs> but, you know, I was I was called upon. I, I said to cat out of uh, Trent, New Jersey, you know, and Camden called me while living in Los Angeles uh, at the time and and uh, had heard my name in the streets or whatever and um, through somebody else has contacted me through social media. Uh, they flew me out to Newark, New Jersey. You know, and I had the opportunity to meet Cass in, in Irvington and Newark, Plainsfield, Patterson, Asbury, all was Hoover. You know, they had different sets of Hoover in uh, New Jersey too. But have a few 107 Hoovers and five deuces and, you know, up there. So, yeah, man, I had the opportunity to do that, man, because like I said, man, you know, you have these these cats who some of them are run out, you know, I got kicked off the turf, booted out the turf for some from Los Angeles, man, and they just go to other states, other cities, man, and, and pretend to be something that they they wouldn't or, or, or not anymore. You know what I'm saying? And maybe because they grew up in that community, they say, oh, you know, I'm from Fidus or, you know, I'm from Swans or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. You know? And, you know, for a person who don't know any better, man, they'll believe that shit. You know? And take to it and then become a, a fucking active game member but never seen the soil, man. You, you know, everybody has to see the soil. Everybody got to come to the land, man. You know, so uh, they was uh, five dudes who were gangster criminal crips in Newark, New Jersey. Mm. And, you know, I can't take the I can't take the ambassador role, but I can actually definitely say for a fact and many can vouch for this is that I changed that that whole narrative, you know, the whole look. So after I left, them guys became who were gangster crips. Mm. So. Just give me a little bit of peace, steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, steady job and some food to eat. Just when you get out of prison, are you still active or are you just like, no, nah, I'm Oh, good. absolutely not, okay. man. No, I'm, I'm not active anymore, man. No, not now, not I'm now. Formally, Let's take it back to uh, I'm in the 97 uh, when you uh, were released. Uh, Oh, when I came home, I was fully active. Okay, still active. I was fully active all all the way up to 2011, man. Mm. I was fully active, man. You know, yeah. I, my name is Lamont, man, but you know, formerly known in the gang world as NK. So, anybody hearing this from any of your followers or whatever subscribers, man, they'll know who NK is. Mm. And I'm big. I'm big NK. So. You know, uh, I changed that whole paradigm, man, that whole lifestyle, man. I had to make a conscious choice to do so mm-hmm. uh, because I just thought it was very important, man, that we, we stopped killing each other, man. And, and a lot of the murders that you've seen came from right cats that grew up with each other or in the same set, man. You know, I've seen a lot of that. Nashville to Los Angeles. So kind of got crazy and watered down to me, man, so I... I fully backed up in 2011 and try to reconstruct my life, man, to do something more positive and better, man. I love that. <clears throat> if you could put a number on it, you know, how many people would you say you lost, you know, be it to death, to jail, to drugs, in regards to this gang life? Oh, man. Oh, man, that's a hard number, man. That's, that's like to the gang life and in Nashville, 
I, I would say, personally, I know for a fact, because there's many more, but personally, probably seven guys, seven cats, man, from Nashville uh, that, was, that got killed, was murdered, man, those gang members. Uh, as far as Los Angeles, man, uh, personally, probably like 16 or 17, straight up. And not, not only from five dudes, all the way up to scale, from nine dudes, nine folks, seven folks, eight tray. And I've been to many funerals, man. That's a fact. Do you think the average you know, former active gang member, do you think that they suffer from some sort of PTSD? In what way? Break you know, it just down, just so you've seen you've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, people go to war overseas in Iraq, and they see their you know their their soldier, their homeboy, or whatever their their commander gets his head blown off. You know, things they've seen things that keep them up at night. You know, to this day, yeah. Um, I, I I may know a few cats like that. Um, it had had it sometimes been a scare for me, like that man. You know, uh, seeing shit like that. You know. Another reason why I wanted to change around, man. So I'm a father, and I had to show a good example to my my daughters and my son, man. So that was important to me. Um, and not only that, but um, to stop the continuation of um, killing my own kind. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a memory on that, man, because. We're between them killing us, us killing us. I mean, we're going to be extinct in, you know, 50 years, man. No, no BS. Right. You said that because I had a conversation with a friend of mine, homeboy of mine, who's from Long Beach. Uh, he grew up in the Insanes. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually with their cat right now. You know, but uh, who's having that same conversation, man? It's crazy. Mm. Yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you are, are doing positive nowadays, and especially this documentary. Tell us about this documentary and what we can expect from it. Well, definitely you're going to see it. It's going to be raw and uncut. You know, uh, I haven't got a, a title yet, but it's definitely going to show um, my full lifestyle, man, my whole life, man, from a child and being brought up on the east side of Nashville and the trouble that I went through, you know, uh, not having a father in the home and getting in trouble at an early age, you know, uh, kind of briefly of what I've been explaining right now in this interview, but more of it. Uh, uh, I'm not into dropping no names on my documentary, but for those who know who's there, who's present, and know the history, they'll know exactly how this shit went down. Um, but a lot, man. You know, I went through a lot, man. And when I decided to make a change in my life, man, you know, and find out exactly who I am as a black man, uh, my whole life started to change, man. You know, so I no longer um, flash gang signs or, you know, uh, a push gang life, man. You know, now I'm definitely uh, for the betterment of, of the black race. Um, I'm definitely a revolutionary for the liberation of, of the black culture and the black race. So that's why I'm at 2021, man. That's March the 5th. That's what we need, homie. That's what we need. And I always kind of like to end this question, you know, the interview with this question. It, let's take ourselves to hypothetical world. You know what I'm saying? If you could hypothetically talk to a 14-year-old Lamont right now, talk to a 14-year-old you, what would you tell him? I would tell him that game banging is not a lifestyle. It's a death style. Mm. And you, you can't win. Mm. And if I could see 20 years in the future at 14, I would have stopped myself, you know, from the life of crime, period, man. Uh, to any old, uh, other 13 or 14 year old man that may be listening, you know, uh, you may think that it's the the thing to do. It's a fad, you know, 
it's all about being lit and smoking and popping pills. But, you know, we got to understand, man, it's a bigger agenda, man. It's a bigger uh, enemy out there, man, that's trying to smash on us, man, and trying to take us out. You know, and we all got to come together, man, as one. And a lot of these OGs need to step up and, and speak to the BGs and, and the young homies and the tinies and the infants and the youngs, you know, the, the babies and the littles. You know what I'm saying? We got to do that, man. We got to do that. So that's what I hope to see, man. Mm. You know, hope to somebody who listen to somebody just change. Even if it's just one person, man, that's that it. changed their mind. That's it. You know? That's what I want to do with this documentary, man. After you see this documentary, I want to be able to spark the mind of somebody young, mm -hmm. whether if it's a, a male or female, man, teenager, or even an older person. They may be in their early 20s, man. You know, I want to be able to spark something in them, man, to make them want to change, man. Cause that's what it's all about. Man, dog, we need more people like you in this world, homie, and I really uh, look forward to your documentary, and I hope you and I can stay in touch, maybe even have you back on in a couple months just to catch up and maybe get a little bit, you know, deeper, go, you know, like I said, try to try to save some lives, man, because that's what my program is all about in a nutshell. I don't try to glorify shit. I want to reach out to these cats out there via people like yourself who have been through it who spent time in prison who got shot at who saw their friends die and i want them to think to themselves is this the life that i really want and that this, yeah, man. this was the perfect example